found the other day that sometimes you could just look at the problem and figure out what you need to do if, if the derivative of the inner function was already there. But a lot of times it was easier, especially visually, for us to use a substitution. And many times you'll have the option, do I want to substitute or can I just look at this and recognize what's missing and put that in. And that's all right if you want to do that. If you substitute, you have to remember to substitute back. That's one of the things about substitution. There are a few times when you have no choice and you are going to have to make a substitution. And so we're going to look at a couple of problems like that. Uh, we're not an option. Uh, you, you really need to do it. So if we have a problem that looks like this, x times the square root of 2x minus 1, All right, I can't distribute that x in there. And so if I look at this, if I were just thinking substitution, uh, Matt, what would you think we wanted to let u equal? Uh, 2x minus 1, because that looks like it's an inner function. So if we take the derivative of u, that's just going to be 2dx, which I have a dx, but I don't have a 2, so we could do 1 half du equals dx, but I still have a problem. I have an extra x in the problem, okay? And that's not part of the derivative. So what we can do is go back to our u and solve for x. So u plus 1 equals 2x, and x is u plus 1 over 2. So I've got to substitute two things here. Right? I had a u. It was easy to see what u needed to be because that's under the radical, which is sometimes a little difficult to deal with. So once I know what u is, since I have that extra x, I can solve my u equation for x and then make two substitutions here. So when we substitute, we're going to say, we've got x, which we say is u plus 1 over 2 times u to the 1 half, and we have a 1 half du. Since that u plus 1 over 2, that's a constant. I can just pull that out, and this becomes a 1 fourth. What happened to the 1 I'm right here. We usually just go ahead and put that in the front. And I'm going to move the other one, that other one half out, and make this one fourth. What other? This two. All right, now this isn't so bad because I can distribute my u to the one half. And we have u to the three halves plus u to the one half du. And if we integrate, just keep that one fourth to the front, we're going to have u to the, what, five halves times two fifths plus u to the three halves times two thirds plus c. Plus what? C. Oh, this is indefinite. Yes, this is an indefinite integral, so we have our plus c. So we can, now we have to substitute back in what we said u was. And u was originally 2x minus 1. So I'm going to go ahead and distribute that 1 fourth. So we'll get 1 tenth, 2x minus 1 to the 5 halves, plus 1 sixth, 2x minus 1 to the 3 halves plus c. Now, as far as I am concerned, what's 1 fourth of a constant? Still a constant. Yes, you're right, you would. Technically, you would, but it's still a constant, so we just leave it as c. As far as I'm concerned, you may leave your answer like this, but that's not going to match the back of the book in many cases. 
because they're going to factor out the 2x minus 1 to the 3 halves. All right, so let's do that on this one. In case you have a multiple choice question where it's factored out so you can find the right answer. Remember, we always factor out the lowest exponent. Now, if I change this to, how might I want to pull that out? Um, Well, I'm just going to work with this for right now. If these are 66, 6 sixtieths, well, let me, I'll come back to that. So that's going to leave me 1 tenth times 2x minus 1, and 5 halves minus 3 halves is? One, so it's just 2x minus 1, plus 1 sixth, 3 halves minus 3 halves is 0, zero and anything to the 0 power is 1, plus, thank you. All right, so we could, we could still get a common factor we could factor out there, but we're going to have, you could have 2x minus 1 to the 3 halves times, one fifth x minus one tenth plus one sixth plus c, which is still a constant. So there's different ways that they may show it. Um, let me see. I don't think I even have this one simplified. And if we did one fifth x, let's see, this is six sixtieths and ten sixtieths. Is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, so negative six plus ten would be four sixtieths, which is one fifteenth. <laughs> now, you, I don't, I'm not asking you to do that. I just want you to realize if you have a multiple choice, you might have to recognize what's been done. You can leave it as the one I boxed in for me. All right, for me. Just know that that's probably not going to match the back of the book. All right. Okay, here's another one where you're not going to have a choice. We're going to have to use substitution. So what is my u? u is 1 minus x. So what is du? Negative 1. Negative 1 dx. So we have to say that dx equals a negative du. But I have that extra x in there with nothing I can do with it, so I'm going to solve my u equation for x. And so we're going to have u minus 1 equals negative x, or x equals 1 minus u. So if we substitute... We've got our negative with the du, 1 minus u squared times u to the 1 half du. Now, I think the easiest thing to do is going to be square that 1 minus u. Square? Yeah. Do what? Yeah. Oh, you moved the, okay, come on. Square Eight minus. minus. Oh, oh, there it is. is. So we're going to have 1 minus 2u plus u squared times u to the one-half du. Now notice these, it's not the concept that's hard, it's just paying attention to your algebra. u is one minus x, and why you one That's what x equals. We solved it for x. Because I had the extra x in here, Matthew, that I've got to do something with this. Oh, right. 
All right, so we're going to have the opposite of u to the 1 half minus 2u to the 3 halves plus u to the 5 halves. Do you? I distributed. So we're going to have a negative u to the 3 halves times 2 thirds minus 2 uh, u to the 5 halves times 2 fifths. Mm -hmm. Plus u to the seven halves times two sevenths plus c. Now, if you want to, you can go ahead and distribute that negative, or you can leave it like that. But we also have to substitute back in what we said u was. Question? So you can have negative two thirds times what was u? plus four-fifths, one minus x to the five-halves, minus two-sevenths, one minus x to the seven-halves. Plus c. And I'll, you can leave it like that. <laughs> Why should we like, do you know in what case this would kind of probably be like used? Is there like a practical example? There might be, that could be one of your uh, functions where you're trying to find, so they give you a rate of change or something. It's like this represents the number of people coming into an amusement park, the rate of change as people are coming in. And then you have a rate of change as people are going out, and you can find out at one particular point in time exactly how many people are in the park at that time. So like if that happened to be the, equa the equation for the rate of change. Yes, exactly. That's real. We'll look at some applications like that after we've had a little bit more practice with integration. Okay. Are we okay on this substitution? All right. Now, we've worked with, yes, none. We've been looking at indefinite integrals. We want to look at definite integrals. And let's look at the definite integral from 0 to 1 of x times x squared plus 1 cubed dx. Now, I want to use substitution here. I want to show you what you can do. Remember, you always have to remember to go back and resubstitute when you get finished. And what you're substituting in is usually a lot more complicated looking than you. So there's, when you're dealing with definite integrals, there's a way to get around that. So if, what would you be in this situation, Andrew? You? Mm -hmm. X squared plus one. X squared plus one. So du equals... 2x dx, do I have that? No. So we have to do 1 half du equals x dx. We okay with that? Mm -hmm. Olivia, is that all right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if I rewrite it, I'm going to have 1 half u cubed du. We okay there? Okay. Now, if I use 0 and 1, I have to remember to substitute back when I finish. But if we're saying that u equals x squared plus 1, I can substitute this in and get a new lower limit. And my new lower limit becomes 1. All right. You substitute your limits into what u equals so that when you finish, you don't have to substitute back. It saves you time. Believe me, it's often much easier to just plug it into u than it's going to be to plug it into x squared plus 1. 
So if you, if when originally I went from zero to one, but I have a substitution. So I'm saying u equals x squared plus one. I plug my lower limit in to what u equals and I get one. I plug the upper limit in to an x squared plus one and it becomes two. Now I don't have to substitute anything else. When we integrate, we get one half u to the fourth times one fourth or one eighth u to the fourth and I can just use two and one. Otherwise, I have to go back and substitute x squared plus 1 and plug in. Now that's not hard on this one, but you can get some functions where it's going to be much easier to calculate here than if I substitute back x squared plus 1. Yes? I don't understand why you need to do either of those things. Why do you need to do either of those things? Either of what things? Um, either or yes. Either. Either. The first thing that you told me you don't have to. You don't have to. You do have to do something later because later you have to plug in something to do something. Yeah, if I don't change these limits, then right here I've got to come back and say this is x squared plus one. So then we find c. There is no c when you have a definite integral. Now, shh, we're going to have 1 8 times, what's 2 to the 4th? And 1 to the 4th. Oh, do you do this minus this? 1 to the 4th? Yeah. Is this because of the fundamental theorem of calculus? We're doing a definite integral, yes. F of B minus F of A. But the one we got before was. The, the previous ones didn't were not definite integrals. So here we get 15 eighths. See what we can do with this one. What's my u? 2x minus 1. U equals 2x minus 1. What's du? 2x dx. Just 2. So we have to have one half du. All right. Do what? I mean, not you. I mean, we, all of us who are solving this, we just kind of, we're making up a value for you. We're doing yeah, and it's, it's going to be what's the inside function. I bet you got a square root up there. What did you say, Matthew? <laughs> Probably nothing that needed to be repeated, right? Wow. She was like, she was like, <laughs> should we just leave it there? It no, we should tell bad. the class. <laughs> okay. yeah, tell we've, got, we've got an extra X. What do I do for that extra X? <laughs> Solve right here for X. U plus 1 over 2 equals X. Is it okay for me to do that? Yes. No. Thank you. <laughs> I just did it all in one step. Okay, so when I rewrite my new limit, I'm going to plug sh 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 this in here. So 2 minus 1 is 1. That stays the same. But my upper limit becomes 9. And we're going to have 1 half u plus 1, I just move that over 2 out to the front because it's easier, times u to the negative 1 half Wait, du. What there? Right, that should be 1 fourth. Let me see if I can still erase this. Nope. But I can do... How's that? Okay, so this was the original 1 half here, and this is this 1 half. Negative one half because you brought it to the top of the fraction. Yes. Great. So we have one fourth from one to nine of u to the one half plus u to the negative one half. I just distributed du. Wait, 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 wait. I just distributed the u to the negative one half. And then we have our du. Okay, so now we integrate one-fourth times u to the three-halves times two-thirds. 
plus u to the one half times two. Wait, it's plus. Plus. Right here's a plus. Because this was a plus. And I'm going to evaluate that at nine and at one. Do you count off if we don't do that little line thing? No. You can put a bracket. That just helps me remember what I'm using for my limits. All right. To one fourth out front, and then we're going to plug in nine to both of those. Why? Because you have to do. This is our function. You have to do f of b, which is at nine plugged in for the u's. No. You're going from A to B. So A's on the bottom. All right, so the square root of 9 is 3. 3 cubed is 27. Divided by 3 is 9 times 2 is 18, I think. Y'all have me confused now. Okay, square root of 9 is 3 cubed. 27 divided by 18 plus 6 minus. Maybe that's why you have trouble following what we're doing. Making up so much stuff over there. Okay. And then the square root of 1 is 1 times raised to the third power times 2 thirds is just 2 thirds plus 2. Okay, so all I did was plug in 9 for all these. Yes. That's 9 plugged in. This is 1 plugged in. Yes. Okay, 18 plus 6 is 24 minus. Six thirds minus two thirds, or six thirds plus two thirds is eight thirds. Um, six minus two thirds, eighteen thirds minus two thirds is sixteen thirds. And there is your answer. You should already know that. <laughs> <laughs> Remember an even function, if we have f of negative x, it's equal to f of x. The y value stays the same, even if the x value changes. And it is symmetrical to the y-axis. Okay, an example of an even function. If x is 2, if say that's y equals x squared, then y is 4. But if we do negative 2, y is still 4. That's an even function. All right. An odd function. is symmetrical to the origin. We said to determine if you have an even function. If all of the exponents are even, it's an even function. All of the exponents are odd and there are no constants. It's an odd function. The simplest odd function is y equals x cubed. Well, probably not the simplest. y equals x is the easiest odd function. But notice here, if I have the point 1, 1, and I have negative 1, both the x and the y are opposite. See, if f of 1 is 1, but f of negative 1 is the opposite of what I got before, it is an odd function. And the symmetry to the origin. Yes, ma'am. So not every function needs to be either even or odd. 
No, that's right. Not every function is even or odd. Okay. But if they are, it can help in our integration. Okay. And there are a couple of things that you need to look for. And that's the reason that I bring it out. It's actually a theorem. But if, if f is an even function, and this, com this can save you a lot of time, it comes in handy, then if we go from um, negative a to a, negative 2 to 2, negative 3 to 3, negative 100 to positive 100 of f of x dx. If, the, if f of x is an even function, we can calculate that. Instead of using a and negative a as our limits, as twice from 0 to a. And it's so easy whenever we plug in 0, because that you're always just going to be getting the value of 0 when you plug it in. So if you have an even function, and these are opposite of each other, negative a to a, negative 3 to 3, instead of integrating from negative 3 to 3, you can integrate from 0 to 3 and double it. All right, so that, sa that can save you time because it's always much easier if you can, eva if you can have 0 as, as your lower limit. If f is odd, is an odd function, and if we said it, it was a polynomial function, that means... The easiest way to check it is if all of the exponents are odd and no constants. You can always plug in your negative x. If you get the opposite of what you started with, then it's an odd function. But if we have an odd function, and we are again taking the integral, I don't know if that will move up, yay, from negative a to a of f of x dx, that equals zero. So that can save you some time if you recognize you have an odd function. It equals zero. It equals zero. Look here. If we look back up at this one that I had drawn up here, if we're going from negative a to a, this negative area cancels out the positive area, and we get a zero. Okay, so let's look at an example. So that can save you a lot of time, especially the uh, even function. You'll see a lot later when we begin to do uh, area between curves or volumes of solids of revolution. If they're even, it makes it easier to double than to evaluate from two different limits. Okay, so I'm going to move that out. And we want to look at this. So just the fact that I'm going from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 tells me, okay, I want to look. It's possible this could be an even or an odd function. So let's think about this. This is not a polynomial. So let's see if we can determine whether it is even or odd. Now in this case, I'm going to do the sign. I'm going to plug in. Sine cubed of negative x times the cosine of negative x. Because this one you can't really tell just by looking at it. Some you can, this one not so much. Okay. Yeah, we're going from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, but right now I'm just trying to determine is this an even or an odd function? Okay, we said sine was odd, so this is the opposite of the sine cubed of x, and cosine x is even, so it just stays cosine x. Again, sine is odd, so minus the sine of x, and cosine's even, so it just stays cosine x. And if we factor out a negative... Do we have the opposite of what we started with? Yes. So this equals zero. 
Now you could integrate it. You could like integrate the whole thing and then plug in your limits, but you'd still get zero. This one's over here. Okay, Emily. Okay, so the reason why you plugged in negative x was to see if, if it's even or odd. Okay, so you always plug in negative x. <laughs> he said thank you. Thank you. Matt, did you mess with the 